Hey folks, uh, today we're going to be troubleshooting this Cummins QG4000. These are a very common generator in RVs and toy haulers. I was told by the owner that it came back from a rental, it won't turn over, and there doesn't seem to be any oil in it. So we, in troubleshooting this, we need to dial this down to either one or two categories, either electrical or mechanical. We have the information that there looks apparently no oil in it so that could give us the bias that it's a mechanical issue but it could still just be electrical and just a little bit low on oil so let's open up this cover and let's just see what it sounds like i haven't heard it yet i don't know if it wants to turn over just a little bit or where we're at with this so let's see if it'll prime okay it primes so not thinking electrical but let's see Okay, we hear relay engage in our starter. So that doesn't necessarily mean the starter is good, but there is a chance that the starter is unable to overcome the inertia of the crank. But it could still be voltage drop. We could still have a weak battery, voltage drop across our, our battery cable to the starter so it still could be electrical or mechanical so that's what we're trying to discern the first thing that we can do that'll make this really easy is back here there's the cooling fan for the generator and i'm going to try to spin it this is a single cylinder engine even with the spark plug in it's very easy to overcome the compression if you're having a hard time trying to move it with the fan it also takes a 14 millimeter socket on the center of that fan and you can try to spin it that way i'm just going to put my hand back there and see if i can turn this over by hand if i can't well we'll cross that bridge when we get to it okay i've got this fan back here and it is not budging so that's telling me that we have a seized motor all right, so sorry to interrupt, but being out in the field and just speaking off the top of my head, uh, sometimes I misspeak. Being new to generators, another variable that could be at play here is the alternator could be seized. A generator is just a little motor and a giant alternator. So there's a chance that it could be that. I very much doubt it, but I just wanted uh, to inform everyone that that's another possibility that we'll figure out later and test for when we tear down this motor. Generally what that means is that something on the bottom end, something to do with the crank, is been seized up. So what I'll inevitably end up doing is pulling this whole unit and going through the process of showing you guys if we can source a motor, I'll pull the motor, I'll show you guys how that's done, and we'll get a new motor in here and get that taken care of. You know, let's recreate the symptom again. It's primed, we're going for it. We hear that relay from the starter engage, but because the motor's been seized, it, it can't overcome that inertia. So let's get this uh, valve cover pulled and see if we can get some more information. Everything looks fine up here, which again confirms our bottom end issue. Uh, top end, you know, worst thing that would happen is one of these rocker arms would have cracked or gone to the side. Maybe a keeper could have come out in a valve spring and that would just cause a cranky no start. Nothing on the top end is going to cause the engine to completely seize up. Now, I come from the automotive world and in the automotive world, it is extremely rare to do a rebuild on an engine. It's because the en modern engines now their tolerances are so tight, they're so versatile. There's a lot of risk in rebuilding it and investing all that time for it to not work or for it to blow up again and then you have to warranty it. I'm not sure about the generator world. I don't know what I'll be able to do, but I'm definitely going to, at minimum, on this right hand side here, there's your timing cover. And it'll give me a good insight into the carnage that ensued. So we'll definitely take a look in there. We'll see what we can do. Could be something simple. Could be something that's just beyond a rebuild and we have to replace the whole engine. See what went wrong. See how we can uh, prevent this from happening again. 
um, and I'll take you guys along for the ride. So this will be fun. It's funny because I even mentioned my last video where I did the valve lash adjustment on these that I was like maybe I can get a hold of one for a teardown and I was like I can't really afford to buy one just to tear it down but now we have the perfect opportunity to tear down this engine and show you guys its inner workings. What are some other things? So we went over could be weak battery voltage, could be a trouble with the, the cable from the battery to the starter itself. We hear the relay engage for the starter, so we wouldn't really think of a control side issue. A control side would be like, if I hit this and I didn't hear that relay, then that could still be a variable as well. This kind of applies to all engines for, this is known in diagnostics as a no crank, no start condition. And it's, it's the same whether it's on a generator or on a car. Like I said, you wanna start with your two categories, electrical or mechanical and try to rule out which is which. I hope that kind of helps for those of you troubleshooting. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put this valve cover back on. There's an exhaust pipe down here that's gonna be in the way. I'm gonna put a little trolley cart down here and then um, get this thing removed. On this setup, it might not be the same for yours, but we have these bolts securing these slide reels and then this should slide out and then make it easy to access all the bolts that are around. You might run into this security Torx bit if you're trying to pull this unit so make sure you have that because that's going to be a little more rare in that size. Because this is custom to you know the RV company that built it it's not going to be set up the same way on every one so but if really I found the easiest way to pull these is to put a cord under it make sure you have your exhaust out and then you kind of just gently drop it onto a little cart and then roll it out. And then I found that two well-abled people with proper lifting techniques can load this into the back of a pickup. Uh, it's not too terrible, but one other person to help you load it into the back of your pickup. Yeah, I'll get this valve cover back on and get sorted out, getting this thing pulled. All right, so we got the unit out. But obviously before you get it out, you have to disconnect everything that's hooked up to it. So there's five different connections that we're gonna wanna worry about. The first is you have your controller connection. This hooks up to that pad inside your toy hauler or RV, that little control panel for start and stop. Keeps track of your hours and everything. That's what that's for. Second, you'll have a large battery cable, red cable here. And that cable will be hot until or live until you disconnect the batteries that hook up to the generator. You can do it live, exercise extreme caution, and I always vinyl tape the end, whether it's live or not, just in case someone, you know, accidentally hooks up the battery cables and it's bumped up against the frame. But when you do disconnect it, if it is hot, please be careful, don't ground it out anywhere especially since we have to disconnect a fuel line. So there's two connections in here that you'll do. You have your ground point, even says it for us. You have your 110 connection. Now I found the easiest way to do the 110 connection is do it at the nearest J box. If you are not comfortable or don't know anything about 110, find someone who is or does or get an electrician to undo it for you those of you that are familiar with 110 yeah i just undid it at the j box i tie a pull string pull it through that conduit and then that way when i go for a reinstall i can just use that pull string to pull this 110 wire back through it does look like there's a way to access uh, to undo it down here but i didn't want to screw with this module and taking a bunch of other stuff apart and that seemed like a quick an easy way to do that part and then lastly back here you have your fuel line these barbs are very effective at keeping that uh, hose on there so you'll probably have to cut it very carefully and then i use a bolt and the hose clamp that's on there to plug up the fuel line so you're dealing with electricity 110 12 volt and fuel so all of that stuff's really dangerous so be careful when you're unhooking all that stuff up. The shop's a little bit crowded. Sorry, I've got this project going on. Hopefully it'll be done today and then 
I can do uh, some better shots. And then, okay, so once you get that all disconnected, then you can drop it out. I didn't show the process of dropping out the unit because it's gonna be different for pretty much any model. It's just the Cummings that's gonna be universal for pretty much everyone. So we're gonna pop this cover. This cover takes four of these T40s just around the perimeter. So I'll get this cover off and then we'll take a look at uh, what we're dealing with. All right, folks, for those in the audience with a little less experience tinkering around with stuff like this, I wanted to help kind of give a lay of the land so that at least you had some sort of idea of what was going on in here. It's a pretty compact setup, so I know it can look a little bit intimidating, but it's actually pretty basic what we have going on here. First down there in that corner, we have our computer module responsible for giving us our diagnostic codes. Then we have our air intake. This contains our air filter, which is drawn in to our carburetor. It goes down in here into our intake. Once our intake valve opens, it'll bring that air fuel mixture into our combustion chamber. Piston will do its thing. Our spark plug will do its thing. Oh yeah, your spark plug lifts down there. It comes out the exhaust valve to this exhaust pipe down here. And it runs through to this muffler to help keep noise down. There's a little pipe here that goes to this little rod that helps for the choke. This is a separate control. This goes down and attaches to a centrifugal idler control setup. Here at the bottom end, you're gonna have your cam and your crank. And then over here, we got this thick boy of an alternator and we have our starter right here. That fan I was talking about in the other video, it's just right here. The oil pump for these engines is really interesting. It's essentially just a metal stick attached to the crank and it just goes like that and splashes oil all over. And so it's a pretty basic foolproof design. It's not like a traditional oil pump that you would run into. So yeah, that's kind of the lay of the land. I have a lot of experience messing and taking this stuff apart. Not so much this alternator side, but it doesn't look too bad. It looks like this plastic cover. I'll pull the starter motor, unplug this, and then I just have to find a way to detach the alternator from the engine. Whichever one doesn't spin is gonna be our culprit. I'm bending on the engine, but it still could be the alternator. To speak more on the troubleshooting side of things, is there's really two main conditions that we have for engine issues. The better we can define between a no crank, no start condition, and a cranking no start condition, will really help us with our direction. I know troubleshooting can be very overwhelming and it's very easy to jump to conclusions. It's important to just be clear, try to be as methodical as possible. Something that I didn't mention in the last video was, okay, if the fan did spin, but we heard that click, where will we take our diagnostic from there? If it was a no crank, no start condition, that's another important factor and we have a click and we can spin the fan then that's almost certainly going to be an electrical issue if we have a cranking no start condition well then that brings in a, a lot of other factors too that could be your valve adjustment it could be your air fuel ratio your carburetor could be clogged most importantly do some tests you know have a multimeter get familiar with basic electronics and different things. The biggest thing that I always see is people just throw parts at things and that's really not what we want to do. The first thing that I'm going to do is disassemble and remove this alternator assembly and basically see which one spins and which one doesn't. It's basically down to that and then we can make 100% the call. Again, we need to dive into why it happened so that we don't just replace one or the other for it to happen in another few hours. And then we have to pull the whole assembly and do this whole thing all over again. We wanna to get to the root cause. This thing only has about over a thousand hours on it. And it being a really good brand and a really well-built motor and system, 
you know, something went awry. There's another variable at play that caused premature failure. So I've got this other project I gotta wrap up. Hopefully that'll be done today. And then I can start to focus 100% on this, which I'm really excited about. All right, folks, I hope you had another fun adventure in the garage and maybe learned something. Part two is going to be the actual teardown of the engine, and we're going to see what would happen in there. Be sure to like, follow, comment, subscribe, do your thing. I'm trying to grow the channel, but I need more content, obviously. So part two, I already have footage of, and then I just got to get it edited and hopefully it'll be uploaded in the next few days. So yeah, there you go. Have a good one.